That video gets me every time. I've probably watched it 30 times since it was done, at least. And every time inside of me, something is just leaping up like, yes, yes, yes. Like, it's just the anticipation. And, and I pray that this morning, as you are probably a little sleepy-eyed and still adjusting to the time, like something inside you, like that spoke. Let me tell you where that came from. So a few months ago, as, as, as you know, I'm sitting praying, like, God, what are you going to do in our youth ministry? Where do you want us to go? Um, like the ideas of this started taking shape. And a few weeks ago, I was like, man, we got we to gotta promote like who we are, like where we're going. And, and so I sat in my living room in the corner and, and just praying through this. And that poem is what came out. But that poem isn't about me. That poem has nothing to do with me. That poem has to do what our students are called to be. The truth is we, we live in a hurting world. We live in a world where depression does rule the day, where we're looking on, on people that don't even know who they are to define who we're going to be. And that is the way the world is operating, but it is not the way it was designed to operate. We as believers, we are equipped, we were called to make a difference to that. We are to be a blessing. The whole idea, like the word blessing itself, means that we take a little bit of heaven of what's coming later and we bring it now and we introduce that to people now. And so I pray that as you see a video like that, as you hear words, that has nothing to do with youth. Do you understand the vision for that has nothing to do with youth ministry alone? Like the vision of what our culture is and what our world is, and it's not just new, this is true of all time. What happens in the world and what we have to offer and our goal to impact it, to be the difference makers, to be the change, that is not a youth ministry thing. That is a believer thing. That is true against all people. If you sit in this room and you have the Holy Spirit residing within you, you have committed your life to Christ and, and you know for certain heaven is your home, you have a responsibility to bring that message. Like that is why you were made. And you might be in this room or, or online and, and thinking, Mickey, I'm still living on that other side. Like that other side of the hopelessness and the despair and the struggling that comes with it. That's where I'm at. You need to know there is another side. And those of us that are believers, it's our job to tell you, not just in words, but in deed, show you that there is a different life out there for you. There's a different reason you were designed and you were made. And here's what I know. When we come to Christ, I want you to think back in your mind's eye. Those believers that are within the sound of my voice, I want you to think back to that time when you came to Christ. When the truth of the gospel impacted your life in such a way that you had no choice but to respond to the love of God the Father. My guess is these words resonate because in those moments of time, you knew you could change the world. You knew this message had just radically changed your life. A new heart was given to you. Not that, that everything, like we still wrestle with these things in the body, but something changed and you knew forever was going to be different. And you knew that that message that impacted your life, you were excited to utilize it and to change the world. We've all felt that. And, and there, you might have went to a conference or you went um, to a retreat or maybe a phenomenal message on, on a Sunday morning and, and that, that little igniter happened again and you, you realized, like, I can do that. Like, this is what I'm called to be. And, and man, something within you woke up and you did nothing with it. And you're left right now. Here's what the truth of most Christian life is. Where as I look across and as I meet people and talk to people, and I've been here myself, you're frustrated because that passion that was within you, this thing you know you were made to do, and maybe you, didn't, you couldn't put a package on it, you couldn't define it, but it was something, is just unrealized. So there's this part of your heart that's just longing for something, and you just, that's all it is, just sitting there doing nothing. I'm going to be honest. I believe in many cases the church has failed you in coming alongside you and activating that in you and releasing, equipping you to, 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 to find it and equipping you to, to live it out and releasing you to do it. The, because 
if you have these passions, if you are a believer, if you do not use these gifts and these talents and these passions, you're bound to a life of just frustration, of, of just not realizing your full potential. And, and I don't know about you, I don't want to reach the end of my life and have a I wish I would have. That there was this thing in my life that, that I know I was created to do, but because of fear or because of, of a thousand million things that we're going to unpack a little bit of today, that you left it unrealized and that you end your life with regret. But alas, that's where most Christians live. And they're tossed to and fro. They're, they're just life, doctrine, the spiritual life, even like coming to church in small group, like you're doing these things, but they just don't quite fulfill you. But we as a church generally have designed you that if you check those boxes off, you know, you went to small group, you came on Sunday morning, maybe you serve here and there, you've checked those boxes off, you're living a full life. Like you're good to go. And I'm here to say that's not right. Um, I've shared that one of my go-to books in, in biblically sp in the Bible is, is Acts. Like when you want to see what the Spirit of God looks like moving through a bunch of average individuals, go to the book of Acts. There's another book, the book of Ephesians, that is a little bit after that. Here's a group of people that, you know, the, the city of Ephesus was was a, a port town. It, it was, it was a really a central point of, of many different people coming together. Um, it had a lot of adultery in it and, and a lot of just brokenness, but a movement of God swept through that city as Paul was there. And, and they had to learn to live their life differently. Like, how do you respond to your new life now that you are a believer, like now that these things, these passions and are woken up inside of you, how do you live them out? And like you and I, they struggled with it. Therefore, Paul wrote a letter outlining, okay, here, let me help you in this. Let me unpack this. So I want to read through a group of verses. We're going to read it all at once, but then we're going to break it apart a little bit because we're going to see some of where our frustration comes from and why we are where we are today, perhaps as a church. And when I say a church, I don't mean Western Reserve. I mean big church. But we're also going to see where I believe some of the solutions lie within that of how we can turn the tide on that, how we can overcome that and how we can be those difference makers and be that change. So we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith. Did I lose my spot? Until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature or fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up. So in these verses, we start to see in the middle, we see where we might be living now, the struggle going on. But sandwiched on the other side of it is what, where we should be and the answer to it and, and the hope that's to come. So let's start busting this down. Let's just look at verse, four, verse 14 to start. And it's, he says, So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Now we know as we look across Christendom right now, there is denominational, that we are not unified at all. There is tons of different theological positions and people are thrown all over and, and they're deceived not just by these different denominationalisms and different views of, of how to practice faith, but there's actually then there's whole cults out there that say the name of Christ and there's people deceived by that. How does that happen? How are we not unified under the overall arching flag of, of our God, Jesus Christ? 
further, look at we say we may no longer be children. And, and it's that whole idea of a child is where, how we get there because most of us are still children in our faith. We didn't grow up. Think of we children. So right now, if we go downstairs or down the hall, we have children being taught as well they should. We need, need to be foundation, build foundations in their life. So teaching, good. But think about a child, your children, many of you are parents in the room or grandparents and, and those of you online as well. Here's what we know about children. Here's all I know about my, uh, my, even my own childhood. I was completely dependent upon my parents and those that influenced me for what I believed. For what I believed to be true and good or bad. What would hurt me, what was good for me. The way I should live my life. Like Everything was dictated to me and I don't say dictated as in like just told. I mean, I learned by those around me how to live. And to, to this point, if you think back to maybe when you were in fourth or fifth grade, what music did you listen to? Did you listen to your own music? Like, is it your own music that you enjoyed? Not generally speaking. You listened to your parents' music and you called it your own. So in fourth and fifth grade, I was jamming out to Neil Diamond. Like, I remember like... Neil Diamond and Simon and Garfunkel, and I still go back to that, but that's because that's what my parents were about, and I assumed that from my parents, right? And, and that's true. And eventually, as I become my own individual, I gave my own taste, I start to have my own opinions, and I had to start living upon the foundations that my parents had built into me. But we also know that as a child, like think of if you, especially if you sent your kid to public school, like you're building some foundations in them that all of a sudden now there's outside influences impacting that which you are putting into them, right? And now there's competing. Have you ever son or daughter come back and tell you something that, that they now believe to be absolute gospel truth? And you're like, that's not true at all. Why? Because a child is completely, it, it very vulnerable and gullible almost in terms of assuming that uh, those, uh, those authority figures around them, that it's true. They don't yet dig in deep their own to be able to unpack, is this true or not? What do I believe? What do I not believe? In middle school, that's when you start to see a little bit of that happening. Um, high, middle school girls, usually sixth or seventh grade. Uh, middle school boys are a little behind usually. Maybe eighth grade into ninth grade. Um, but then by high school, like a lot of that's happening, right? And, and those of us as adults, we completely were independent thinkers to a fault many times quite honestly but that's the idea like we have unfortunately allowed our churches and our people to think this that to be a disciple of christ means that i know this that i study this and if i know this i'm a good disciple so i i i, I know the stories in here i can quote scripture and if I come to church and I have this spoken over me, if I go to small group and unpack it a little more, I'm a good disciple. That's what we've, that's what we've been trained to believe. For good or bad. And I'm not sure we ever really say that as churches as a whole, but I'd say that's generally how we operate. So, hey, come, if you volunteer at church, um, you, know, you do these things, you're good to go. But because of this, because we have not equipped you to live out life as you're supposed to, as you're called to, just think of what, you, what we do with our kids. Our kids, we eventually start, we give her some responsibilities to, right? So they can start learning what it's like to be responsible adults. And eventually, like our goal in our children is eventually that they operate completely independent of ourselves. That they are human beings that are offering positive influence in the world apart from us is that not our goal as adults as parents as grandparents guess what our job is as a church to do the same thing with you so this whole idea that that we still have people that are just they can't feed themselves they don't know how to live the christian life is a Failure, not necessarily just on your part, but on our part. Because we start to see in the scripture that, that there's more. That there's more going on. 
And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a bold statement really quick. This belief that this is what discipleship is, and if you check those boxes, you're a good Christian, because we've allowed this, and, and I say allowed like we have some authority, and that's not what I mean, but because we've generally gone this way, we've done a disservice to the world. And I believe we've done a disservice to our country. It's why we live in this post-Christian culture. Because at the end of the day, what we've created are a bunch of consumers. You depend on those on stage, those leading your small groups, to tell you what to believe, how to believe it, and how to act upon it. And there's a level of truth to that. But if we stop there, we've missed it. And that's what we see in the scripture. So let's look at, so there's a level of truth. Let's talk about the level of truth in that. And we see that in Ephesians 4.11. That yes, there are people in this church, both that we know of and are unknown. And unknown because they're either behind the scenes or unknown because they're sitting in seats not yet realizing their full potential that have the capability to equip everybody else. And, and so we see this, and he says in verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. So these are gifts to the church that are given by God for a purpose that we'll unpack in a moment. Now these seem like super spiritual words. And, and so sometimes we just bypass them and we're like, okay, that's not me, so I'm going to go past it. I am going to show you that it's, it is you, but B, we want to understand what this is so you can start to maybe identify some of that maybe in your own life and then also see it in the lives of others because we're completely dependent upon the fullness of these type of roles. So let's break down what this actually means. Let's look at apostle first. So an apostle is one who is sent. Being the nature of being sent means that they are externally focused. And when I say externally focused, it, mean, it means that they're not really focused on the people within the church. So they are focused generally outside of the church. And they're also not very focused on today. They're usually very focused what's happening tomorrow, what's happening three years from now, what's, what are we doing for five years from now. Um, like they start to see gaps and they start to see things and they want to react to it and they want to drive change. Um, if you think of the change management bell curve, the, 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 uh, the apostle is like that 2% that are initiators. My business people get what I'm talking about in here. Um, and, but what I want you to know is, like if we were to put a business term, like what is an apostle, it's, it's really an entrepreneur. Think of that. Now, I fall very much in this realm where I, I struggle sometimes even to focus on today. I'm so focused on three or four years from now, I oftentimes miss the moment. Like God will be doing something amazing right now, and I miss it because I'm so focused on something down the line. Um, and it, I have to consciously force myself to kind of focus in and, wait a minute, there's people here that need me, or there's awesome things happening right now, and it's a conscious thing of mine to be able to do that. So the apostle very much looking at the ministry of the church saying, okay, how do we engage our culture better? How do we do these? Oh, we need to church, plant a church in that area. Or, hey, there's a, minute, there's a need. Here's how, what we got to do to meet that need. That's very much the way they think. Does that make sense? Prophet, one who knows. Obviously, the prophet's going to be very internally focused. Um, and, and as far as timing, like, like the um, apostle is focused on tomorrow, the prophet's kind of integrated where they're looking at today in light of tomorrow. So they're very focused on what you do today and the, 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 the way we're living and, 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 and the what we're doing has an impact on our tomorrow. And so very much that idea of that. Um, and the role that I, if the prophet, I, I put manager um, I'm a project manager by day, and it very much fits within the realm of, of, of the prophet. Because here's the role that the prophet says some hard things. They say hard truths to people that they don't always want to hear. 
So my job as a project manager oftentimes is, you know what, if we keep going in this direction, we're not going to hit our timeline, we're not going to hit our budget, we're not going to accomplish what we want to do. And when I sit in front of executive sponsors, that's the last thing that they want to hear is that you're over budget and behind time. But it's my job that regardless if they want to hear or not, to say that's the truth. And a manager's job is then to come alongside and help get them back on track. I'm a project manager as well. So that is the role of the prophet. They are to look at God's word and say, okay, this is the mission of Christ. Our job, we have, we have a ministry of redemption, but if you keep living your life that way, you're not going to fulfill what you have over here. You're going to miss what you're actually going. Like we think of them as hardcore, and they can be sometimes. The prophet can be a little harsh sometimes. Do you have that person in your life that says those difficult things, and sometimes they're just a little gruff about it, but it's the things you needed to hear? Don't kick those people out of your life. You need those people in your life. The church needs those things in, their li in its life. Otherwise, we start to go and we start to wander. That w to and fro, you know, winds of doctrine go in different ways. The prophet helps keeps us on track. The evangelist, one who recruits, obviously external focused again, very focused on today, and they're obviously a recruiter. I don't like the word recruiter because it, it makes me think that, hey, we're going to go convert people. That's not very exciting, and that's quite honestly, I think, an ugly word. That is not the role of the evangelist, just to convert people. That's not what we're doing. We're not converting people to anything. Conversion is completely a man-made thing. You know what the evangelist does? The evangelist knows the impact that Christ has made in his or her life, and it is so deep and so profound that that need to share it never leaves them. And they are able to communicate the truth of the gospel and the grace of the gospel and the love of our God better than most of us. And you, quite honestly, you'll never shut them up about it. it. It is the person that went to a phenomenal restaurant and you talk to them and every time you talk to them, hey, did you check that place out yet? Did you check that place out? Shut up. No. <laughs> I haven't checked it out yet, but that's the way they want you to try it because it's that good. That is, that is the evangelist. The shepherd, in some versions, it's the pastor. Not, not the pastor necessarily as the overseer. We put the term pastor, and I think we use it incorrectly, personally speaking, because, you know, yes, there is a leader, um, but this pastor, this is a, like a shepherd. This is someone who cares for, um, and obviously they're very internally focused. Like they are worried about the well-being of the people. They're very compassionate. Um, they are able to, to, they're very empathetic and able to come alongside you. Um, they want to make sure you're comfortable and that, that things are going well and, and, and come alongside you. And they'll cry with you when you need to cry and laugh when they need to laugh. You know, me, I, I'm horrible at that, quite honestly. I wish I was better, but I'm just very bad at that. And, and I think of this as, like, in the business term, the human resources realm, right? Like, that's human resources' job, to come alongside, make sure that the people are well cared for. I find it very humorous that in the past five years that we've, we've really, in the business world, that employee engagement has become such an important thing that the engaged person is actually more productive. When here we have it, it's in the, been in the Bible the whole time. Duh. It's, we need to. We need to care for our people. How can you reach the world if you need to be cared for? And then we end with teacher. One who explains, obviously, again, internally focused. And I say they're integrated again in their timing and their focus because, again, they're, they're again very focused on today but in light of tomorrow. They know what's coming. We know in Scripture what's to happen, and, and we know the patterns that have existed in humans since the beginning of time. And, and we know that you know, kind of the, the whole next series, what you're doing today is going to impact who you're going to be tomorrow, right? And they're a trainer, now, what I want you to notice as we look at the totality of these gifts given to the church, that if we focus all of our energy in any one or two areas, we are not going to accomplish the mission set at hand. What happens if a, if a company is completely focused on human resources? I want my employees to feel good. Like, yeah, they're going to have some happy people, but are they going to accomplish the mission that that company sent out to be? Are they going to be well-trained to actually accomplish the, what that business is set up for? No, they become internally focused, and it's all about me, 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 me. 
Don't tell me that's where the Church of North America generally sits today. We are a consumeristic church where it's all about what can I get. When people go church shopping, the general question is, what are they giving me? What can they do for me? That is not the question to be asked in Christdom. Where do my gifts fit within this church to be able to serve is really the way that it's supposed to be. But because we've operated very much under that shepherd mentality, we've missed it. If you'll start to notice, it takes all of these roles working together to accomplish the mission of Christ. And in the life of a body, that's going to ebb and flow. There's going to be times where one is more important than another. Yes, we're going to have a mass time of recruitment, and, and so therefore the evangelist is really in. But once we bring people in, and people have come and they responded to the body of Christ, they need to learn like, what it means to be part of the family. And guess who comes in then? Then the teacher comes in. And the teacher, the role of the teacher is now becomes a little bit more important for a while. Oh, and then they're going to, life hits. Life happens sometimes. So therefore, you're going to need the shepherd come along to, to build them back up, to encourage them. And, and if we never focus on the apostles, we're never thinking in the future, the church is going to find itself outdated. Like, I, it, with a complete inability to reach its culture because it has no clue what the gospel means and how to communicate the gospel to the present culture because no one was thinking. No one was doing that outside looking. Notice how we need all these working together. Now the question should be at this point, does that mean that the answer to this, this not being a child in the faith and, and not being thrown away by winds of doctrine, does that mean that we just make sure that those leaders in the church are able to fill those roles? In part, yes, but that's only part of the equation because the scripture goes on to talk about this more fully. It continues on to say that the reason these are given, the reason these these people are gifted, and again, some of you sitting in this room are some of those. As I was preaching, I'm watching heads, nods, and little pokes going on saying, that's you. Why were you given those abilities? For just yourself? No, life is never about you. You've given those to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Now let me pause for just a moment. That word saint do not put it in our Northeast Ohio Catholicism box. It is not some person that fulfills some special qualifications that some miracle had to happen and some people had to vote. Like, No, that is not scriptural in any way, shape, or form. A saint is any person that has the Holy Spirit that resides within them. If you accepted Christ, you are a saint. You are the elect. You are a royal priesthood. That is the qualification, nothing else. Got it? Okay, so to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry? We've talked about that. That is the ministry of reconciliation. The, the whole idea that we are created to do, to be good to, and, and to, to be with God forever and, and to actually carry out being image bearers of Christ, but that was broken through sin and the ministry is to bring that that message of restoration to all people. That is the ministry. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ until we attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. Those things exist so that we don't give in to those other things. So I have to make the assumption then the because we live in the red is because we have not lived out the first part of the white. It is a simple cause and effect. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who, uh, who is the head, into Christ. Jason Haymaker is not the head. He is a phenomenal leader, and I love him to death, but he is not the head. Christ is the head. He is one of the roles that is needed to get us to where we need to be. Does that make sense? from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint, every with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Here's the bottom line. We are not paid to do the work of the ministry. First of all, I'm not paid at all. 
But those in the church, those leaders, we are not paid to do the work of the ministry. We're not. Here's the general philosophy that happens. I put in tithe, and I am, by giving tithe, I'm paying you to do the work of the ministry. That's the way the North America church operates, and whether you want to admit it or not, there's people within my voice that that's the way you live. Mickey, it's your job. It's Jason's job. It's Kevin's job. You do the work. I pay you to do it. I'll come here Sunday morning, and I'll listen to you. I'll come to small group, but you do the work. That's not what that scripture said. It is our job to equip you to do the work of the ministry. And part of the work of the ministry is that then you are actually going to train other people to do the work of the ministry. And then see how this happens? We don't sit here because 12 guys decided they were going to do it themselves and no one else had to do any work. We did it because 12 guys, when Christ ascended, said, I'm going to train everyone else to do it so when we die, the work will continue. And thousands of people were carrying on the work of the ministry. And people were be being added to them daily because everyone owned the work of the ministry. See, Jason at one time, and, and I love this, had started praying a prayer which is dangerous to pray. Don't pray things unless you want to see them come true. Because he started praying, I want, us, I want our church to be like the book of Acts where people are doing that. What do we have today? Well, you have a worship team and a worship leader that is not on payroll. That they're fulfilling their role in the ministry. You have a children's commission that is doing the same thing. You have me and youth doing the same thing. There's not often times that I'll point and say, be like me, because I'm an idiot. Like, I say the things, wrong things, I do the wrong things, like, don't be like me. But in this, I will call you to. Listen, nowhere in there did it say, go to seminary, did it? Did it say, go to seminary? Here's the truth is what's happened. The church has relegated its duties to everybody else. The church is to make disciples. The church is to train. And we've sent everyone to seminary saying, if you go to seminary, then you're prepared to lead. That's not what happened in this book. And I like that I am bivocational. I like that I haven't gone to seminary. Why? Because no, no one has an excuse to say I can't do it. There's no reason I stand on this stage and you can't. The church discipled me. The church rose me up. A variety of people spoke into my life, teaching me what it looked like to live and, and own the ministry of reconciliation. It has been the failure of the church to do this. And I'm going to read a statement because I, I wrote it and I don't want to misspeak this. I'm going to read it probably twice. Failure to release the body of Christ to do what she was made to do results in shallow, immature body mo more focused on Christian culture than on the mission of Christ. I'm going to read this one more time. Failure to release the body of Christ to do what she was made to do results in a shallow, immature body more focused on the Christian culture than the mission of Christ. And I'm going to make an even more bold statement. The greatest enemy to the gospel today is not the outside culture. The greatest enemy to the gospel today is the Christian culture. The one that says if we wear the Christian t-shirt and we check those boxes off, that we, are, that we are strong believers. That have allowed other people to carry out the ministry. The Christian culture we have built in North America is the greatest enemy to the gospel because it is not a picture of the gospel at all. Because we haven't owned that. Now here's the truth. Each of you in this room, before the world foundations of the world were laid, God knew you. He knew exactly the time He would place you in. He knew exactly the people He was going to place in your life. What part of the world He'd put you in. 
He gave you specific gifts, specific talents, and specific passions in which for you to carry out the mission of reconciliation to the world so that you could be an agent of change to the entire world. I get we just ended a series on being difference makers. I guess it's like post-scene credits, if you will. You all are equipped and called to carry on the ministry of reconciliation to this world. And I want you for a minute to picture what would happen if all of us in this room, all of us online, owned that. What would happen to suicide rates? What would happen to drug addiction? What would happen to depression? What would happen across the, go through the gamut. What would happen if all of us were to own our goal in that? How God made us. And what if a church, we stopped being about just what happens here on Sunday morning, but started being about equipping you to actually carry out how you were made. We've started with these commissions, but I think those are only the first steps because the next steps are equipping the rest of you to do the same thing. And it's not just in the church. Not all those roles were inside. We miss it. If all of our focus is in the church, we've failed. We cannot expect the culture to come to us because we've been irrelevant too long and there's no reason they should want to come to us. We have to start living that life and being relevant and going out, meeting them where they're at. That is the whole nature of Christ himself. So here's what I know. I know that when a message like this is preached, the Holy Spirit is waking up some animal in your heart, and now, right now, it's shaking the cage, saying, yes, let me out. And here's the danger. You experience this moment where something in you is awakened, and you walk out this door, and you go back to life as normal, and nothing changes. And what happens is a year from now, you hear a similar message or some other message, and it's awakening you again only to still be caged. And that's why you still live in this life of frustration, knowing you have this potential in you, but never releasing it. Because we're never asked you to do anything about it. Come hear it. You've learned it. Now you have the head knowledge. Listen, we are far, our, our knowledge far exceeds our obedience. And that's the shame of this whole thing. So here's what you have. You have these cards sitting on your, by you somewhere. I want you to basically fill the same bit, top out, same things out. On the top, I just want your name and contact. It could phone number, email address, whatever. I'm gonna, you're going to turn this part in to the offering bas- basket when it comes, and it's going to come to me. And I want you to write down what your big idea is. What's your calling? What is that animal in your heart that God's shaking right now? If you're online, what I want you to do online is I want you to email me so that your, your host is going to go ahead and put my email, mickey at wgrc.life, and put it in there. Just email the same things to me. So we're not letting you off the hook just because you're not here. But we'd love to have you here. So put that in there. I, and here's my promise to you. You write down your big idea. What's that animal in your heart that God's waking you? My promise to you is sometime in the next six months, I'm going to reach out to you and ask you how it's going. You're like, Mickey, there's like five, 600 people that are here this morning. How are you going to do all that? That's why I gave myself six months. <laughs> and it's worth that time. It's that important. Like this is what I will give my life to for you to realize your potential. But what about the bottom? So listen the bottom write the same thing like what's the big idea but then write start making a plan and definitely your next step like what is your first step then what i want you to do with this bottom card is if you're in a, if you're in a small group i want you to bring it with you this week and start sharing it help people design that plan with you make it real this is when god moves like this is called a kairos moment it means it means this moment in time where life will never be the same it's not like a time like it's 8 30 it's time like nothing will ever be the same again and if you don't react to it you're just going to get hit with this time and time again till you respond so i'm giving you an opportunity to respond so go to your small group they will help unpack it for you they'll help equip you in it if you don't have a small group get one um talk to your wife students in my students that are in here you are not off the hook Students, you can change the world with your parents. Go home with your parents. Unpack this with your parents. But that is our response today. I do not want you to just live this life wondering what could be. 
Let's together serve, together become what the body of Christ is called to be, and let's change the world. Let's pray. Father God, I first just beg for your forgiveness. Knowing that we as your bride have not represented you well. You've called us to a mission so many times we've just abandoned it for our own selfish desires. But Lord, right now, as part of the repentance of acknowledging that that is true, I pray that we as a body respond by each of us taking our responsibility as ministers, that we're all ministers. That is the nature of the term, Lord, that we're just servants to you. Lord, would you speak to us during this time? Would you lead us how to release this animal you placed within us so that we can be your church? that we can be agents of change in this world, that we could invade darkness with the light of your gospel. Be with us during this time. Amen.